Okay. Um, so we're going to pick up where we left off on Monday, which was if we take an aldehyde or a ketone The first thing I can do is react that with an alcohol, <coughs> and that's going to make a hemiacetal or a hemiketal through the mechanism that I went over on Monday. So this one is a hemiacetal. Why is it a hemiacetal? Because originally it came from an aldehyde. How do I know in this molecule that it came from an aldehyde? <clears throat> because a hemi, the hemi part has an OH and an OR group attached to the carbon. So the first thing you have to do is find the carbon with the two O's attached to it. If it's an OH and an OR, it's a hemi. If it's two OHs, it's a hydrate. If it's two ORs, then it's either an acetal or a ketal. How do I know if it's an acetal or a ketal? I'm always going to have one R group attached to that carbon with the two oxygens. If it's an R and an H, it came from an aldehyde. If it's two R's, it came from a ketone. So this is so this is a hemiacetal the way I've written it. And then what we can do is with that same acid catalyst. I can add a second equivalent of alcohol, which I'll call like our double prime OH. It could be the same alcohol as the beginning. It could be a different one. So I can kind of switch in between. And now I'm going to end up with not the OH, but now I'm going to end up with the two ORs attached. And that, in this case, is going to be the acetal because it came from the ketone. Or it came from the aldehyde. It's over. They're over by the door. So this is the equilibrium that we have going from an aldehyde to a hemiacetal to an acetal. And we went through that mechanism. And I think I'm asking you for that mechanism on the take-home quiz problems that are in today's folder that are due next Monday. So the question is, where does the equilibrium lie with this reaction? What we saw was for most compounds between aldehyde and ketone and hydrate, for most compounds, the equilibrium lied towards the aldehyde and the ketone. Only under exceptional circumstances did we get hydrate. The same thing's going to be true here. So the equilibrium in this case is going to lie to the left towards the products except when I make a cyclic acetal or a cyclic ketal, then the equilibrium is going to lie to the right. <coughs> That's going to be the time when it does lie all the way to the right. So we're going to, so let's go over that situation and then I'm going to tie that in to what you learn in biology about sugars. So how can I make a cyclic acetal or cyclic ketal? The easiest way to do that is to, again, take my generic aldehyde, and now I'm going to react it with ethylene glycol. And if there were three carbons in this, this would be propylene glycol. Um, there's different propylene glycols. Some of them are in, I don't know, uh, health, uh, skin care products. Some of, if you go online, I'm sure they, they'll kill you. There's some website that'll tell you they'll kill you. 
um, propylene glycols. Ethylene glycol kind of will kill you. Um, ethylene glycol is what we use in antifreeze to keep the engine from boiling over or freezing because when you add it to water, it lowers or raises, raises the boiling point, lowers the melting point. So if you're putting antifreeze, you know you're, if you spill it outside on your driveway, you're supposed to clean it up because animals like it because it's nice and sweet and then it kills them. So we ethylene glycol is a little bit poisonous. But we use it as basically what we call a protecting group for aldehydes and ketones to make these cyclic acetals. But you could have two carbons here, you could have three carbons here. The three carbon, the three carbon propylene glycol, for the most part, that's not toxic. So if you have a car with environmental antifreeze, it's got an extra carbon in there. So one carbon can make a huge difference in the biochemistry of a molecule. Well, don't drink methanol, and you can drink ethanol with two carbons to, you know, moderation. But if you drink methanol, you go blind. So there's another example. One carbon makes a huge difference. But I digress. So how do we make a cyclic ketal or cyclic acetal that will actually be stable? So here's my aldehyde my ethylene glycol, my acid, first step in the mechanism is protonate the oxygen and in this case I'm going to protonate the carbonyl oxygen. Okay. So same step as before. Now the difference here is that one of these two OHs and the ethylene glycol is now going to add to the carbon. Okay, so it'll add one of the OHs will add to the carbonyl, the pair of electrons will go up to the O plus. And we'll now end up with an with a COH with the O. H and then the rest of the ethylene glycol. And then I'm going to lose the H plus and the H plus is the acid so it's going to go on and come off and go on and come off in all of these, well in all the mechanisms that we're going to talk about. So now I'm going to end up with my hemi with my hemi acetal. Okay. So it basically is exactly the same mechanism as I wrote before. All of these have the same mechanism. So now I'm going to do what? From the hemi from the hemiacetal part, where am I going? What's the next step? So I'm going to protonate the OH. I could protonate the OR group down here, but that would take me backwards. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue to protonate the OH. And if I do that, I'm going to end up with my oxonium ion. Someone, what? Lose water. You don't have to even raise your hand, just lose water. That's our next step. The water leaves. Okay, so I'm going to lose water. And I'm out of space. 
I know, I need to go on to the next slide. Is everybody ready to go on to the next slide with me? Why am I even asking? I should just keep going. I should just go to the board one day and write with my right hand and then erase with my left hand and go across the board back and forth and see who can keep up. There was somebody I there's somebody who did that when I first started teaching. I was amazed that they could do that. Again, digress. Okay, so here's where I'm at. Here's my carbocation. Um, now, what's going to happen is this second OH, since it was already in the molecule, this one is now going to wrap around and add to the carbocation. And so what I'm going to end up with is a one, two, three, four, five carbon ring, or five atom ring. So attached to this carbon then is going to be one, two, three, four, five, and two of those are going to be the oxygens. And then the oxygen that just added gave me the H+. Plus. There's, did you get the notes by the door? So that's so that's how it's going to go ahead and that's how it's going to go ahead and wrap around things. So now I'm going to then in the final step just lose the H plus, and it, and all of these are equilibrium steps. I'm going to lose my H plus and I'm going to form my cyclic acetal in this case. This would be a cyclic acetal. Again, why is it a why is it cyclic? Cyclic because it's got a ring. Why is it an acetal? Because uh, the carbon with the two oxygens attached, those two oxygens are OR groups. Why is it an acetal? Because it's got an R and an H, which means it came from an aldehyde. So in this equilibrium, this would the equilibrium would lie to the right. So in this case, I can make this cyclic acetal. I can get it out of my reaction mixture. I could probably recrystallize it, or I could um, distill it. I could do column chromatography on it. This cyclic acetal will be stable as long as it doesn't touch acid and water. Okay. So this is stable to everything except H plus H2O. Because the minute it reacts with H plus H2O, it's going backwards. And as a matter of fact, if I wanted to convert this back to the aldehyde, what I would do is I would use H plus with excess H2O and use the Chatelier's principle to push the equilibrium all the way back to the beginning. And that's important because these cyclic acetals can be used as a protecting group for an aldehyde or a ketone. And the fact that they're cyclic means that they're stable. Okay. But if I want to keep them the way they are, I can't let them touch acid. Okay, so this mechanism is pretty much the same as the one we did on Monday, except now I've got two OHs and the two OHs are attached together. Everybody, any questions? Everybody kind of see that? 
And you'll have an opportunity to again do these. I may make this a one credit or hope. Make this a like standalone take home quiz. That's the way I normally do this one. And you have it. All you have to do is follow the notes. But eventually you're not going to have notes to follow because I always sort of ask for this on the next exam. But let's worry about getting through today first. So I've just made the cyclic, I've made a cyclic acetal or a cyclic ketone. Now, where have you seen these before? Let me kind of skip ahead here to where you may have seen these before is in your biology class. And so this is a table of uh, aldoses. There's aldoses and ketoses. And I, we usually don't get too much into this because this is what you're going to learn if you take biochemistry and they can teach you the biochemistry because they can do it much better than I can. It's only been like 25 years since I've taught basic biochemistry for like dietetics. But we always start with the idea of aldoses and ketoses, and that basically means do I have a molecule, a sugar molecule with an aldehyde here, or do I have one with a ketone, which would be something like fructose. Okay, so these are all sugars or carbohydrates. And when you write these all out, you've got glyceraldehyde, you've got some things in here like glucose, galactose, um, mannose, all of that stuff. And you may have already learned these in your biochemistry slash genetics slash other class. But the reason that these are important is because this is a practical example of how we form cyclic acetals and how we form cyclic ketals. Because these are the open chain forms. <coughs> and the D in this case is not D in terms of rotating light in the positive direction. Because in biochemistry, D and L are based on, I think, the position of one of these OH groups in the chain. So it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with our optical rotation. Um, because it's a biochemistry D. And I think it's actually written with a slightly different font for that. But these are all optically active. They all have chiral centers. So what do they do? Well, here's your glucose in, in an open chain form. And what the glucose does is this OH down here will come up and basically add to the aldehyde of carbon-1. And when it does that, it closes the chain, and it basically forms, if I was looking at this molecule and asked, is this a hemiacetal, hemiketal, what is it? I find the carbon with the two oxygens. I see an O and an OH, which makes it a hemi. And then I see a carbon and an H, which means this is actually a hemi a cyclic hemiacetal. Now nobody ever uses that term in biology. They don't say, oh well this is your cyclic hemiacetal form. They kind of leave that for organic. And you could also do this with fructose. Now fructose is a ketose, which means that it has a ketone functional group. And so again, this OH that's highlighted will come in and add to the ketone, and it'll cyclize only in this case to form a five-membered ring, and the carbon with the two oxygens is now carbon two. It's got an O and an OH, an OR and an OH, so it's a hemi, and in this case it's got two carbons attached to it, so this is a cyclic Hemi ketal would be fructose. 
So why is this important? Because when you take these linear forms of the sugars and you put them in water, they're like 99% cyclized. And so this is the predominant form, the cyclic, the cyclic hemi acetal and the cyclic hemi ketal forms are the predominant forms in water. And again, that shows that principle that these are stable hemi acetals and hemi ketals. So I, I doubt anybody's gone into that much detail in, if you've seen these before in your biology class. Now, and also, look, they're writing this as a planar ring, and we know from first semester that that should be a chair cyclohexane. So we're still kind of using models. So if you take glucose in solution, um, the glucose is going to be less than 1% in an open chain form. The rest of the 99% is going to be in a closed chain form or in a cyclic hemiacetal. And this position of the hydrogen is where you get the terms alpha and beta depending on where that hydrogen is. And really whether that hydrogen is axial or equatorial. But again, we can't tell from a straight, from a flat ring. Now, uh, in your, in top hat, there's a section on the anomeric effect. And they're getting way into this. But one of the reasons why it's important to know whether the hydrogen is in the alpha or the beta position is because these two molecules will actually react much differently depending on where that hydrogen and where the OH is. And that's what's called in sugar chemistry the anomeric effect. The fact that these two react differently with certain molecules. And I'll, pro I'll talk more about that um, later, but it is you'll see that as a section in the in the top hat in I think we're in chapter 22 now. Okay. So again, this is an example of a cyclic hemi acetal in real life. And there are some consequences to this as well. Okay. <coughs> so let me go back to a plain slide. Where can we use these cyclic acetals and cyclic ketals? Well, we've already talked about protecting groups. I know it was like three months ago. It was maybe like a month and a half. Seems that long. And we used a silo group to react with an OH so that I could keep that OH group from reacting and then I could use fluoride to strip off the silo group. I can do protection using this cyclic acetal and cyclic ketal as well. Let me show you two examples. So let's say that, I don't know, for the sake of argument, I had, I always like to do Grignards. So let's say I wanted to take this molecule, I wanted to react it with magnesium, and then carbon dioxide, and then H plus. So I want to react that bromine with magnesium to make the Grignard, react the Grignard with CO2 to make the carboxylic acid, and then protonate it. So my goal is to actually add a C, o, a C double bond O, OH group to this molecule and make that molecule. So I want to add that group for the bromine. So I sit down and I propose this synthesis. And then I take it to somebody and they chastise me or fire me. Because they're like, well, that won't work. Why not? Why wouldn't it work? Aisha? So once I make this C minus, that C minus is going to attack the carbonyl. 
You might say, really, is it going to stretch around there? Remember that when we write things on paper, we're writing it as if it's an individual molecule. There's billions of molecules in solution. So it's probably not this C- minus is going to attack that carbonyl, but it's probably going to attack another carbonyl of another molecule in the solution. So I cannot make a Grignard. We learned before you can't make Grignards in the presence of groups that will deprotonate, like alcohols, water, carboxylic acids, and H's. But you also can't make Grignards in the presence of other functional groups that the Grignard will react with, like ketones and aldehydes and esters and all of those. So this is a great place to protect. So before I do the Grignard, I would say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and react this with my ethylene glycol and my H+. And I'm going to go ahead and protect that ketone as the cyclic ketal. And what I just said a few minutes ago was this molecule is stable to everything but acid and water. So I could take and react this with magnesium and CO2. Notice I didn't add the acid in the water yet. Jacob? Well, let's not get too far ahead here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and react that carbon with the magnesium, make the Grignard, react that with CO2, and I can now accomplish that step that I couldn't accomplish before, and now I can go ahead and add the CO2 group to the ring, except I'm going to make the carboxylate. I'm making the carboxylate because I haven't added the acid in the water yet. So my point here is, what is my point? My point is that, again, this isn't an acidic, this isn't acidic conditions, so that as that ketal is going to stay intact if I make it a Grignard. The Grignard will not attack, will not react with the acetal or the ketal. And so now I have to add my then H plus H2O step. And whenever I do that, I always add excess water and acid. Bless you. So I'm always adding excess, so it doesn't, I don't actually sit down and say, okay, I'm going to add, you know, two equivalents. What would two equivalents be? In lab, oh, oh no, I'm talking about lab and lecture. What I would do is I would actually just add water, acid and water, and mix this around. And then I might test it with pH paper until it became acidic. And then I know I'm done. So when I do that in this step, adding my H plus H2O to do my final step, which in this case is going to accomplish two things. It's going to protonate my carboxylate to make the carboxylic acid, but then it's also going to take my It's going to take my as my ketal and convert it all the way back to the original ketone. So I'll actually deprotect and protonate the carbox and protonate the carboxylic acid at the same time. And so with any of these, we actually don't ever figure out how much acid and water we we just add it until the solution's acidic. And sometimes we'll even add ammonium to this 
if we're concerned about the H plus reacting with another functional group. So this is another example of protection and deprotection. So that's its same basic principle as what we had with the silo, making the silo ether, ether from the floor. Everybody with me? <coughs> now, sugar chem if sugar chemistry, um, we actually can do this in with sugars. Only we're going to have to change our thinking. We think about a glycol as what's going to protect a ketone. When we do protection in sugar chemistry, we already have the OH groups. And instead, I'm going to add a ketone to protect those. So here's an example. So I'll just kind of generically write some sugar there was a time it was actually a time it was probably 30 years ago when there was a thought that particularly given the 70s oil embargoes which I know none of you were even close to being born then but there was a time when you could only buy gas like on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, and then other people could only buy it on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays um, because there was an oil embargo from the Middle East. And there was a thought, oh no, we need to be able to make our products not from oil, but from maybe some other renewable resource like sugarcane. And so there was a thought that you could make everything you needed from plastics to fuel using sugar. And we still ferment sugar to make ethanol that we either can burn in our cars or drink or both. And there are and we could make plastics from it. It hasn't quite hit that that topic hasn't quite come around again, but it will the next time there's an oil shortage. The other use of sugars would be in terms of drugs, because you've got to get you got to get the drug molecule. And again, and I'm going to be, and I'm almost, I'm almost illegally practicing biochemistry here because I have one semester of biochemistry, second semester senior year, that I was taking with first semester bio. Senior in bio doesn't work out very well for the freshmen, particularly when they're taking biochemistry. There's no curve. So that was my situation. I only have one semester of general biology and one semester of biochemistry. So sometimes I say I know this much and my fingers are really close together. Sometimes I'm sandbagging you because I know a little bit more than that. So I'm really close to the edge of malpractice of biochemistry here. But I'll stay on the legal side. So you got to get a drug molecule inside the cell. And so you've got to somehow get that drug molecule through the cell wall. And a lot of drug design is putting something on the drug to carry it inside the cell wall so that it can get inside the cell and do what it needs to do. Well, what a more perfect molecule to attach to that drug than a sugar molecule. But in order to do that, you've got to figure out how to add groups mostly to the OHs. And the problem here is that you have one, two, three, four, five OHs that look very similar to each other. So how do you stereo or how do you regio selectively choose one of those OH groups to add the drug molecule to and not the others? And so when you're doing synthesis with sugar chem with sugars, you do a lot of protection and deprotection. So for instance, let's say I have two OH groups that are cis. That part of the molecule looks like ethylene glycol. So if I want to protect those two OHs and make sure they don't react, let's protect them as a cyclic ketal. And let's use something really simple to react it with. Let's react it with acetone. 
So let's say I use acetone along with some acid. The acetone is going to react with the glycol to basically what we would have thought a minute ago to protect the acetone by forming a five-membered ring. But what we're really doing is we're protecting the two OHs with the acetone molecule. And they have to be cis because that's the only way we can form that five-membered ring. If it's trans, there's not enough room to link between the two OHs. And if you're saying, oh, I sort of remember something like that in the past, we'd go back to last semester when we talked about adding something like KMNO4 to a double bond. We got a five-membered ring, but the KMNO4 always added the OHs cis. Same thing was true for OSO4. So if you're going to form a five-membered ring or a four-membered ring, it's always got to be cis. So in this case, if I reacted those two, I could protect those two OHs as a cyclic ketal. <coughs> and there are other groups that you could attach that you could attach to the OH to protect that OH, and we already saw one of those. Maybe with one of these OHs, I could attach something like the silyl chloride to it to protect it. There's other groups, there are mom groups that you can use. But the whole idea in sugar chemistry is you spend more time protecting and deprotecting than you actually spend doing productive chemistry. Because you've got all these OH groups and they look the same and you have to differentiate them by protecting some reacting the others, then deprotecting, then reacting, and and so that's in your in drug design if they're trying to use a sugar to attach the drug to it to make it go into the cell, <coughs> bless you, then that's what you have to do is you have to think about how to protect <coughs> bless you, that OH group. And so that's how we can do it with acetone. And the beauty of acetone is that when I want to deprotect Going this way, I would simply add acid and water, and it's acetone. So how easy is it to remove acetone? Extract it with water, rotary evaporate it off, because it's acetone, it's got a really low boiling point. So you'll see, sometimes you'll see this in a scheme, and basically what I'm doing is I'm protecting the OH groups the cis OH groups, because these have to be these have to be cis, but I can protect those OH groups with an acetone molecule, and that's just thinking opposite of protecting a ketone with a glycol. <coughs> so again, trying to relate this, and I'm only superficially relating it in terms of the general idea of the drug design. But that's what you have to do with sugars is you have to be able to preferentially react one group over another and they all look the same. And so this is one way we can do that. So that's using cyclic acetals and cyclic ketals as protecting groups. And this would have normally been our first time protecting but since we saw the silo ethers before, it's the same principle. <coughs> okay. So that's kind of semi real life chemistry. And cellulose. What's cellulose all about? Oh. If you have your glucose with your oxygens here, or with your OHs, we can actually link those together to make ethers. And the way you make the ether is 
you could use acid to do this. I mean, plants will take the glucose and make cellulose out of it using enzymes so they don't need just straight acid. But when you link those glucose molecules together, that's where you get things like cellulose. The long chain polymers that, that make that up. And of course, breaking these things apart isn't exactly the easiest thing in the world. And if you take a six-membered glucose ring and you do this with a five-membered fructose ring on the other side, that's sucrose. So that's your table sugar. The table sugar has both fructose and glucose. So there's a whole bunch of biochemistry there. There's a whole bunch of nutritional science there. Right? Like high fructose corn syrups, bad. Right? They'll kill you eventually, I guess. But that's, but then the, the idea of, well, you know, the sucrose breaks down into glucose and fructose. If you just have fructose, then that's, you know, apparently won't raise your blood sugar, um, but it's not very healthy. And so you see high fructose, you'll see no high fructose corn syrup, but it'll have, still have sugar in it. So, all right. What else can I do with aldehydes and ketones? I can also add HCN to them. So I can make what's called a cyanohydrin. And in, in every textbook, when you talk about cyanohydrins, there's always this bug that's shooting stuff at, a pre at something that's trying to eat it. So there is a bug that actually keeps um, hydrogen cyanide sort of on tap. And when it's threatened, it can generate the HCN and spray it at the thing that's trying to eat it. And then that thing doesn't just leaves and doesn't eat it. Um, but it can't just keep HCN present. What it does is it does it as a cyanohydrin. So what is a cyanohydrin? If I take HCN and react it with an aldehyde, what you can think about is this adding. Now, the problem is HCN is um, hydrogen cyanide, the last word being the most important, cyanide. And so we don't like to keep, we don't like to keep HCN ourselves because um, it'll be a gas and it'll kill us. And uh, so this goes back to 1986. Again, you weren't born yet, but I was graduating from college. And there was this big Bhopal, India incident where they had storage tanks of cyanide that reacted with water and formed this plume of HCN that was uh, an environmental human tragedy. Um, and so that's when that first came into pl play, and I think that was the DuPont. I think DuPont was the one was the company that had that happen. Up to that point, DuPont's um, their motto was like better living through chemistry. And then after that incident, that kind of disappeared because chemistry wasn't viewed upon as better living at that point. So we can't just have HCN gas. So what we do is we would react, we would have cyanide that would react with this aldehyde. It would make that basically alkoxide. And then in the second step, we would add the H plus to that in order to make the cyanohydrin. So while we say we're adding HCN, we really aren't. We're adding CN minus first, and then H plus to protonate the O minus. So the cyanohydrin is what the bug keeps on tap. And then when it feels threatened, it locks and loads and sprays HCN all over what's trying to eat it. Now, what do we use cyanohydrins for? 
in the one of the next chapters we're going to talk well i already talked briefly on monday about the about nitriles as being carboxylic acid derivatives and what a derivative of carboxylic acid is is something that when it reacts with h plus and h2o it forms a carboxylic acid a nitrile is one of those derivatives so if you add cyanohydrin, if you make the cyanohydrin, you can react it with H plus H2O, and you can convert that C triple bond N into a carboxylic acid. Why is that important? Because that's how you can make what are called alpha hydroxy carboxylic acids. Has anybody ever heard, seen on the ingredients list, alpha hydroxy carboxylic acids or hydroxy acids? I hope not. I don't think so. There are carboxylic acids in sodas, but not this particular one. If you look at a hand cream or a moisturizer or something like that, you may see that there's an alpha hydroxy carboxylic acid in them. It's really good at retaining water. So that's a way to make that molecule, which has sort of a consumer product or an additive that goes into different consumer products, which is chemistry. I mean, that's a huge, huge, there's a huge number of chemists that work in the personal care products industry. I mean, you, could, you can rank them on whether or not where they rank in terms of people who are trying to make cancer solving drugs, but, you know, we don't normally do that. But that's where, that's where a lot of of development goes into. Okay. So that's a cyanohydrin. It's as, it's as straightforward as that. But it's the second step that really is the important one. But I'm pretty sure sh I'm pretty sure I haven't skimmed through the chapter yet, but I'm pretty sure there's probably some reference to this bug. So when you see that, cyanohydrins. Okay. <coughs> So, we've added oxygen species to carbonyls. OHs, ORs. What about nitrogen? Well, what we're going to find out on Wednesday is that I don't need acid as a catalyst for these reactions. Because if I add acid to this reaction, the acid is going to protonate that nitrogen, and it's no longer a nucleophile because it's got a positive charge. So the next set of reactions that we're going to talk about are going to be add nitrogen to a carbonyl, but I don't need acid. And the other thing that's going to happen is these are addition and elimination reactions, so I'm going to form a double bond after I do this reaction. Okay. So that's that's where we're going to pick this up on Friday. What I just if you're following along in the book, what I did was I kind of left out the I I've skipped over the first half of the chapter. I'm going to go back to that because the first half of the chapter was probably review, but we'll go ahead and review that after we talk about the new reactions. So in the folder, there's a problem set for Monday. If you have any questions about that, I will see if I have your exams on Friday. This is not a great week of trying to get stuff done. And so hopefully I'll get them done by Friday. If not, I will definitely have them on Monday.